होता है Okay, got it. There we go. Okay, can you can all can you all see that? Yep. 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 Good, 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 good. Good question you're not supposed to ask, isn't it? Really? Can anybody not see that? Is a better question. But anyway, well, look, this is um, this is uh, talking through um, an article that Michael and I had uh, published in email uh, a few months back, and. Um, and that's the title, Developing and Proposing Rational and Valid Principles for Effective School Governance in England. And what I thought I'd do is walk our way through this article and um, uh, with a view to kind of uh, opening it up for scrutiny, checking it out, um, you know, uh, querying our assumptions and that kind of thing, just so we can take the ideas forward, really. And... Um, uh, you know, just uh, actually think, yeah, take thinking forward. And uh, right, so well, at the heart of it, um, point number one there, um, you know, you get in all in all the guidance on school governance. You know, these are the principles of effective school governance in England, but with never any explanation, no rationale um, for the principles of effective school governance has ever been made explicit in in any guidance. Okay, this article addresses that issue and develops and proposes such principles. And it comes out of ideas that Michael and I, by the way, I'm going to take the lead on this. M Michael, as well, when will we'll, we'll chip in and um, uh, as he so often does very, very productively and helpfully. And um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll press on with that. Article uh, addresses that issue and develops and proposes such principles. Okay. So it's a theoretical article. In that regard, it's <coughs> quite heavy going. Um, so uh, I've chunked it up into th we chunked it up into three parts, and um, and uh, uh, with opportunity for clarification on the way on after each part. So we can have kind of have a general discussion, Rosanna, and um, well have a have a clarification discussion at that point, and. Um, uh, and then at the end, there's three questions that we could discuss in groups. OK, um, the article. Um, yeah, the arg there's an argument that we try to make quite explicit in the article. As ever, I'm very keen on article uh, arguments in any kind of document, be it an MA assignment or a, a D thesis or a journal article. Um, there they are. Uh, the essence of the argument, effective school governance secures the legitimacy of schools as institutions. That's the first thing. Ensures that schools are legitimate as institutions. That legitimacy, institutional legitimacy, is achieved through in institutionalization processes. So there are things that can be done to secure um, an institution, uh, the legitimacy of an institution. And centrally, effective governance is concerned, therefore, with uh, overseeing and ensuring that those processes of institutionalization. So really uh, quite a apparently simple logic, uh, but if it's going to be, an, um, if it's going to stand up um, to scrutiny in email and get past the reviewers, um, you know, who are increasingly, um, you know, concerned about the quality of any articles and that, and I'm wholeheartedly with that. Then you need to be quite clear on what your argument is. And six, sorry, two general and six specific principles that should um, and <clears throat> for effective school governing are identified and proposed. Okay, so next slide. Yep. Can you do the next slide, Lisanna? Yeah. So just you know this a little bit of context and the central issue. Um, so, yeah, 27,000 primary, secondary and special schools in England. Uh, over half are local authority ma maintained. Remained about 9,000 are academies. That's numbers have probably shifted since we wrote it, I'm thinking, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, academies are mostly in uh, multi-academy trusts. OK, so uh, I include that really just to point to what you've got to do in a in a journal article, and that is, and actually you see it in the title, you can't assume people know the country, the city that you're talking about. So it's an international readership, so you have to make that quite clear, which we do in the article. 
But the, crew, the crunch point there is um, 2015, DfE said, look, gu guidance on school governance uh, applies to all schools and uh, regardless of the age range of the students, primary, second, special, whatever, and governance arrangements, you know, whether you're an academy, a multi-academy trust. The guidance we set out applies to all. And that's quite an interesting big statement to make in terms of um, developing principles for, for rational and valid governance. Okay, so uh, whatever you come up with has got to be applicable. And I think the, the things we've come up with actually are applicable not only to school schools in England, but FE institutions, other institutions in England, and to schools elsewhere in the UK and elsewhere in the world. Discuss sometime. Okay. All right, next, next slide. Yeah, there's a lot of words in all these slides. I'm sorry about it. So look, core functions um, are specified. Um, uh... Okay, Chris. I think we lost Chris for a little while. Michael, do you want to pick up on your phone? Oh, right. There he is. Oh, I'm back. My internet connection's unstable. Okay, sorry. Okay. Are you my back? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, so three functions are described, no explanation given. Um, so those are the three, clarity of vision, and you can read that, holding executive leaders to account, overseeing financial performance. So, I mean, if you want to be really picky there, you know, it's, um, well, I don't no rationale there. Why those three? Those three sh have shifted very, very slightly over the over the years, but um, that's what they um, uh, that's they, they've remained more or less that. Okay, um, and there we go. Handbook states the functions are common across the education sector. Uh, good, got that from the earlier slide, uh, and share their fundamental principles with governance in the charity and business sectors. Well, if you look at the, the charity and business sectors, that commonality is not immediately apparent. So that's a claim which I can't see as, uh, we can't see as really valid at all. Okay, so, you know, we're even on more shaky ground in terms of the validity of the uh, these um, functions, these um, uh, principles. Okay, next slide. OK, well, let's just talk a bit about institutional legitimacy. Uh, as I've said earlier, you know, effective school governance concerned with ensuring the school's legitimacy as an organisation. OK, is this entity that you're governing legitimate? Well, what do we mean by that? Well, legitimacy of a social entity is secured when that entity's actions. I love this by Suchman. It's just so good. Desirable, proper or appropriate within some socially constructed system of norms, values, beliefs, and definitions. Okay, so is what you're coming up with here, what is expected, what you're producing here as a result of your governance, is that, does that, um, uh, is that entity that you're governing, does that meet the expectations that we have of a school? Okay, that's so, and I think that's quite a reasonable thing to an expectation of the outcomes of governing. And, um, you know, so legitimacy is, is foundational. Um, legitimacy centers on the relationship with and congruence between an organization, still talking about organizations here, and, and that will be a little bit clearer in a minute, relationship between organization and institution, uh, and the congruence between an organization and its environment. So, yeah. Uh, ensuring that congruence is crucial and effective governance has a pivotal role in ensuring this congruence. Okay, so it's um, it's around, um, uh, you know, making sure that what the institution is and does is congruent with expectations in its environment. Okay. All right, next one. Okay, so something on the nature of institutions. Institutions are significant social structures that give a sense of constancy, stability, and significance to social life. Okay. They can both empower and limit action. Well, social institutions, what are they? Well, 
you know, do judicial courts, um, you know, I don't know, police force, hospitals, you know, um, I don't know, social care institutions, universities, um, you know, you can you can come up with a long list of them. And um, <clears throat> uh, so wide ranging. It is legitimacy. OK, so here we move from talking about organisations that uh, move between organisations and institutions. So you can have an organisation, but it may not be legitimate. So you can think of a drugs cartel or a, uh, a street gang or a um, uh, gang intent on knife crime, whatever. They are there, but would you say they were institutions? OK, and that is that is the distinguishing characteristic. Um, uh, institutions are legitimate as organisations. And they become, in, uh, organisations become institutions through the process of institutionalization. OK, next one. Right, OK, any questions so far? Are we all right? I, you're going to have to um, direct me to questions because I don't think I can see or I can. Anybody want to ask a question? We don't have any in the chat at the minute, Chris. OK, just just an observation, Chris, because it does make you think. I was just thinking of institutions that are not legitimate. Oh, go on. And there, that makes you think. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, writing the paper was a tricky one at that point. You know, yeah, you know, it's a brothel of institution, you know, mm, discuss, you know. Well, yes, it's legitimate in terms of the people who use it, but to actually wider society, I'm not quite so sure, you know. But, House uh, of Lords. Yes, indeed, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I mean, a lot of these assertions are up for are up for discussion and debate. But you've got to assert them and kind of explain your rationale for them. But you're right, Andy, to draw attention to that. Yeah, no, well done, well said. Anybody else? No. Good. That's helpful. So that's really uh, straightforward bit. Okay. So then, the um, notion of institutionalization. Well, institutionalization is a pro series of processes, purposeful actions uh, of individuals undertaken to create and maintain their organization's institutional status. Okay, so it's this institutionalization that uh, secures legitimacy. And the institutionalization processes are there and defined. In the uh, journal article, we, we, um, we uh, rely a lot, uh, we lean a lot on Richard Scott's uh, work on institutionalization, which is a really terrific read. And, um, uh, um, um, but, uh, you know, we don't fall down at the altar of, of Dick Scott when we, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, when we're writing the articles, people often do, you know, writing about Bourdieu and people like that. No, what we seek to do in this is to use his framework, but to, and to enhance his framework. So that um, uh, you know we're using and enhancing, which I would argue is good, um, uh, good academic work. And the way, fundamental we, way we do that is to bring in what we call the institutional primary task, um, which is a notion that um, Tristan Bunnell, Mike Fertig, and I um, brought to the fore in education and trying to understand you know what's legitimate uh, call your, your school an international school what right have you got to do that and um well it's to do with the work you educational work you do which is the primary task of the uh, institution okay so let's talk a bit about primary task okay so next slide okay lots of words on here sorry about that Right. Well, this goes back to um, uh, the work of, in my head anyway, the work of uh, Rice, who's a um, uh, system psychodynamicist, whether that's a word, so he's expert in systems uh, psychodynamics. And um, he just comes up with this um, phrase, you know, it, it, essentially it's the task an organisation must perform to survive. Okay. And so for an institution to survive, you know, and it it has its roots in that field because uh, it's very easy to avoid work on the primary task. 
and to seek to avoid work on the primary task. And uh, for a whole set of reasons, not least of which, you know, <coughs> going to be called to account, task like difficult, you know, there's a whole whole set of reasons. And so you find organizations <laughs> often reluctant to um, to uh, <clears throat> to engage with the primary task. So you can see then we've got an immediate link for an institution survivor such as task performance must be deemed legitimate by key player players within its governance network. Okay, so um, that's uh, you know deemed to be legitimate. Yeah, within all those organisations that got an interest in, in its gov in its governance. Okay, um, you've got then <clears throat> in the literature. And Scott falls into this trap. You've got a uh, a link between organisation. How does the task relate to organisational goals and organisational purpose? We, in the paper, we argue they're different. Organisational goals are what you seek to achieve by working on the primary task. Okay, and purpose is the rationale for the primary task. Okay, it's not. Uh, so it's what we're talking about here con is conceptually different. The institutional primary task from organizational goals and purpose. Okay, uh, work on the primary <laughs> task requires resources of some kinds and uh, some a range of kinds. Um, and importantly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Rick Scott's work, okay, he, he comes up with these, these institutionalizing processes, uh, which he referred to as to as which he refers to as pillars. Okay, and um, we'll come to that in a minute. And uh, they're, you know, we because they hold up the process of institutionalization, we say they support the work of the institutional primary task. In the article, we 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 ramble around on what a primary task might be, and um, yeah, one of the things that we discuss is uh, work Michael and I did way back now on very effective primary schools where. We defined what we did and discovered empirically about the, the what we call the primary task of these schools, and it was to um, uh, it provide uh, teaching for learning and to improve teaching for learning. And I just remember that moment when we, I think we got the book out by that stage, Michael. And Michael said, "I'm thinking, Chris, you can't I'm going to do an Irish accent. Sorry, I'm thinking, Chris." Um, uh, you can't just have two primary tasks, can you? No, I don't. No. So, well, you've always got a third one, haven't you, Chris, which is deciding which primary task to focus on. Ah, right. Okay. So, you know, but so for the purposes of the uh, text, you know, we come up with this one, which is a working one. Schools, governors, whatever, could come up with their own primary task for their school. But something not a million miles from the provision of education for the students attending the school is not a gazillion miles away from a sensible primary task. Okay, key point here. The schools work on this task and the resources such work requires is a sense is a, a central concern or our central concern, sorry, for school governors. Okay, so we got there, we've set up the primary task, right. And it's important. Next one. Okay, so we've got these pillars of institutionalization, which is what Dick Scott calls the you know three aspects of institutionalization, the pillars. Right, here we go. So there's three. Um, uh, the first is a regulative pillar, which is about rule setting, monitoring, sanctioning activities. Okay, it's um, you know it's evident in institutions as laws, rules, sanctions. You know. Oh, why is that relevant? Well, schools, uh, school governors need to ensure that the school uh, keeps within the, the laws and the rules. Why do they do that? Well, in truth, it's just um, uh, easier to do it than not. Because you don't do it, you're likely to get a thwacking. OK, so why do we have um, uh, DBS procedures and a strong policy in that? Well, because it's the law. And uh, faff around with that. Why? Because you're only going to get caught by the law and um, you know regulatory uh, authorities will have you for that so there there are certain rules and um, you've got to abide by certain certain rules and uh, there will be sanctions if you you know, you know 
depending what happens on that. So that's the regulative pillar. He then talks about the normative pillar. Well, they have kind of schools are obliged to be as they are in certain ways, and they they provide a basis for evaluating activities. And he he Dick Scott says it, they comprise norms and values. Norms. Practices considered to be legitimate in pursuit of valued outcomes. Okay. All right. So what do you do? Well, do you know what? We have, um, I don't know, parents evening every term for each year group. What I don't know, whatever. Um, you know, we have a secure timetable. Oh, right. Okay. We have uh, an induction program for our staff. Right. Okay. Uh, so these are norms. Uh, and they may influence the moral basis of many institutions, including schools. And why do you do it? And well, we do it for this reason. And that gives us a strong moral standing, uh, a strong, secure moral ground to stand on. So, you know, and, and you're doing there what's expected of an institution of this kind. Uh, and values, notions of what's preferable and desired, along with standards of uh, standards of uh, <clears throat> against which structures and practice can be evaluated. So these are the things that kind of uh, shape and frame, you know, norms and there's an interaction there. And, um, you know, practice and structures, do they conform to our values? And, you know, <clears throat> governors need to um, ensure uh, that the school school confirms to both these these uh, norms and the values um, you know, uh, expected by society. You know, is this, are you doing the right things, the things that are expected? Okay, next slide. And the third pillar is the cultural cognitive pillar. Okay, probably the hardest for governors to get into and understand, but it's essentially the schemas, the, you know, the sense-making schemas that enable uh, people in that organisation to make sense of what goes on, to interpret what they see. And <clears throat> it's, it's about the shared understandings of reality. As a community, do we see and interpret things the same way? This creates a particular mindset, OK, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> focused on specific ways of, of reflecting and acting. So you would expect, you know, teachers walking down the corridor and seeing some uh, pushing and shoving going on, they'd act in a broadly similar way. That isn't the way we do things around here. Um, and people would reflect on what they see and act appropriately and make sense in a broadly similar way. And uh, <clears throat> it influences how people think and behave. And as such, you know, creates this collective consciousness. These cognitive frames, um, you know, explain how information is processed, remembered, recalled, and uh, it shapes what the members of the institution attend to. Are we worried about behaviour in the corridor? Yeah, actually we are. And as Michael and I, from research we did with that project we did with Bill Beals, getting the culture right is, um, is deemed to be important. Okay, <clears throat> and so again, as with the other pillars, School governors need to ensure that the cognitive processes are in line with what is expected of the school as an institution by wider society. OK. All right, next slide. I think it's a bizarre one. Well, here we go. Don't feel you need to take all this in because uh, Alex, the, the paper goes on to explain these. But this is this is Dick Scott's work. And he calls the, <clears throat> you know, things like what's in this table. Um, these are the carriers. These are the carriers of the various pillars. OK, if you look to the left hand side of the table, you'll see symbolic systems, relational systems, activities and artifacts. So <clears throat> symbolic systems, um, you know, uh, what kind of symbols ensure this what kind of th things make sure this happens relational systems you know how do interactions and relations in within the institution secure these three pillars how do various activities what do you do okay <clears throat> and you know things about action and practice there and um 
what about um, artifacts, things around the place that you can see uh, that actually convey and carry adherence to those the three pillars. So, you know, let's just go down one of them, regulated pillar. Um, well, symbolic system, rules and laws. They're written out somewhere where you can see them, okay? And they are, um, you know, you can go to them and check them. In a relational system, well, they're about governance systems, power systems, um, <clears throat> you know, are they, are they appropriate in terms of, of what you expect or is the caretaker running the school or is the head teacher running the school? Um, and, you know, what about activities that relate to those? Well, it's about monitoring, it's about sanctioning. Uh, it's also about disrupting, you know, actually, uh, if something isn't right, then it, it's legitimate to disrupt what is not right. And then you might get objects complying with mandated specifications. So you go into the entrance hall and you often see on the wall some kind of certification about um, oh, some kind of HR process, some kind of, you know, uh, conforms to some kind of, you know, this school has been vetted by, you know, the DBS system or whatever, and found to be of high quality or things like that. Okay. And then the other three are the same, <clears throat> except your normative pillar relates to, you know, values, expectations, standards, regimes, authority systems, relational systems, activities, or what are people's roles, what jobs they do, what are the routines or the habits that actually secure that pillar and carry that pillar? And um, what are the kind of, you know, when we do things together, you know, how do, do we, uh, we are, you know, the norms as expected. And what you might get there is objects meeting conventions and standards. And we, I'll explain what those are in terms of school in a moment. <clears throat> and then symbolic systems, you know, categories, typifications, how do you kind of categorize, um, you know, schema, frames, what are the kind of frames, ways of thinking, what are the schemes of, of interpretation? And relational systems, well, you know, you get sort of some kind of, you know, isomorphism, organizations broadly similar in the, in the way they, they act and they behave within the whole system. Um, you know, what are activities? Well, it's people's predispositions and scripts. How do we talk to students? You know, what's our predisposition? What do we attend to? What do we, what do we look for? And there you look, and again, you're looking for objects of symbolic value. And, uh, you know, they can be, well, we give, we make presentations at, you know, at the, um, the school prize day. And what are they for? You know, that kind of thing. Okay, well, that's um, some pretty chunky stuff in here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay, do you want a break now? I was going to have a break in a little in a moment, but shall we just have a pause there for uh, any questions and a breather? You okay? Um, yeah. Anybody want to talk? Any hands up or anything? I can't see any at the moment, but I'm yeah. sure colleagues will put it okay. on. Okay. All right. Time. Good. Good go. I'll bash on and we'll have a we will have a break. <laughs> okay. No have, problem. Have, hold in mind is something mm, I didn't quite get that. Uh, run that past me again, Chris. <clears throat> um, you know, although I said in the first slide, the logic of this is really quite straightforward. Drilling into the detail and securing the detail in the article is really what counts. So that's why. I'm pleased that we managed to do that and we got that into the uh, into the journal, which is quite an achievement these days. Right. So back to the regulative pillar. OK, so, you know, how is this carried? What evidence would governors need? What kinds of things are we talking about here to, to show that these regular these pillars, which are part of the institutionalization process, are being um worked worked through are being carried out are being undertaken because through this institutionalization process we secure the legitimacy of the school and that's what governors are fundamentally concerned with that's the logic okay so evidence how are these things carried okay um 
Okay, thanks, Abdullah. Good to see you regardless. Work getting in the way. You can't have that kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> okay, um, so again, we've got these four carriers here: symbolic systems, relational systems, activities, and artifacts. Well, as we've, it's symbolic systems, as I've said, schools conform to the law of the land. For example, employment law, requirements of inspection bodies such as Ofsted, their own policies, their own codes of practice and procedures. Okay, so if you don't conform to those, you're likely to get a bit of a thwack there. Okay, evidence in the management structure of the school, secure governance, appropriate relations with external organisations, and agencies such as the local authority and funding bodies. OK, um, <clears throat> uh, it, so activities comes from monitoring procedures, ensure that these um, activities are properly carried out and appropriate action taken as a result. OK, artifacts, material objects, policy documents, certificates, documents on display that conformed with and showed <coughs> conformance with legal constraint. So that's how that um, pillar is secured, okay? And the next one, okay. Uh, <clears throat> normative pillar, right. Uh, symbolic systems, so again, we've got the same carriers, same set of carriers. Carriers would include the school's mission statement, expectations of student behavior, and the dress code for staff and students. Okay, <clears throat> are those the norms that you would expect for a school. Uh, relational systems, the way authority-based relationships function, disciplinary process for staff and students, and the way appropriate behaviour is sanctioned and appropriate behaviour is rewarded. Okay. And then we've got <clears throat> activities, evidence in roles, tasks, habitual and routine ways of working. <clears throat> The practices of those holding the organizational positions, undertaking of tasks, uh, for example, parents evening, and the habitual sharing of, of pedagogic practices. Okay. They include information about the school in the school prox prospectus and a statement of the school's curriculum provision on the website. <clears throat> so is this school in uh, <clears throat> does it conform to the norms that you would expect a school? to conform to. All right, next slide. <clears throat> right. Um, okay, then we've got um, uh, cultural cognitive pillar. Okay, symbolic systems, evidence uh, and carriers of this um, pillar. Symbolic systems, models of pedagogic practice developed by the special needs department to meet diverse learning needs. <clears throat> you know that um, is this about you know does this shape how we are as a culture uh, document sets out principles underpinning differentiation of curricular provision in maths you know <clears throat> again shaping the culture document sets out procedures for organizing school trips again setting out the culture interesting relational systems <clears throat> um, the way um, just make making sure you know let, you know does would be the way schools practice compares with other similar schools in terms of its relations. <clears throat> okay, next uh, next slide, and then we've got activities. Okay, these are things that convey and carry and evidence the cultural cognitive pillar. So <clears throat> how does the head teacher describe the school's mission to parents or prospective students? <clears throat> how does, you know, got two here on, you know, the way the school communicates students' progress to parents. What's the manner of that? What's the nature of that? Yeah, it does it, that's the norm, but how does it do that? Yeah, we've got a school, school's council, but do you know, do we, do we really, are we bothered with it? Well, yes, we are, because we think it's significant. Uh, and then artifacts, part of the school handbook that deals with staff-student relationships, trying to set out this is how we do things here. Displays of students' work actually <clears throat> shows what we value, what we 
<clears throat> that we, we appreciate school's work and we think students' work is significant. Prizes for student achievement and what those prizes are awarded for. You know, so you, you get there as, you know, how that culture is actually um, conveyed. Okay, I think there's a break now for, allow my voice to calm down. Oh, yes, no, ha. Huh? Well, we've then got the whole thing about um, the role of the head teacher principal in effective governance. How do you know this? This is in guidance. <clears throat> head teachers are responsible for the internal organization, management, and control of schools. Board responsibilities hold them to account. Yep, with it, with it. The board appoints the head teacher and manages their performance. In that regard, <clears throat> well, we often don't see it like this, but it's a, a delegated management relationship. Next, um, next one. <clears throat> so, in that regard, the board's relationship conforms to the principal agent model of government. Governing body of principals, head teacher, you are our, our agent. Right, okay. <clears throat> but that notion is somewhat confused in practice, as the head teacher principal is typically a member of the board. And so we drift into a stewardship model. So, yeah, um, we work alongside the head uh, teacher. We work with the head teacher. He's one of us in many, so many regards. He's in there day to day and you know, he runs the school. She runs the school. They run the school. Um, <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, actually, uh, they're, they're one of us in that regard. Um, you know, <clears throat> so um, nonetheless, given responsibility, the governing body delegates the HP, <clears throat> it should call the, the head teacher to account for the proper pro, you know, fulfillment of those responsibilities. You'd expect the governing board to do that. Governing board should ensure their performance is proper and that the head teacher develops uh, their practice appropriately. So that's got to be there, given the relationship between the head teacher and principal. And that's all a bit, a uh, little bit confused, I think, in because of uh, that, um, that uh, um, you know, the head teacher typically being a member of the governing board. Okay, next slide, which I think is, uh, oh, we should have had a, somewhere there'll be a, uh, let's have a break slide. Okay, well, let's have a break there. Probably got the slides a bit muddled up. <clears throat> so any any thoughts on what I've said there? I've said a lot. Um, any thoughts? Would it help if we scroll back through? Mm. I, I have a point, Chris, if that's okay. Yes. In the absence of any, any others. I was just, <clears throat> thanks. It's really interesting um, presentation um, so far. Um, I was just looking at the the pillars uh, that uh, make an institution and trying to trying to relate that um, <clears throat> to the notion of a multi academy trust and and a school. Um, uh, it appears to me that they all the pillars apply to a multi academy trust, but they don't apply to a school. The regulatory pillar, for instance arguably doesn't apply to a school, it, it, it uh, uh, defaults to the trust. So does that mean to say that a school isn't an institution if it belongs to a trust? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> historical question, but there we are. Where you would expect a school, regardless of what the those overall governance arrangements are, any individual entity, the school just down the road, you'd expect that to be legitimate as an institution, wouldn't you? And, um, you know, it's intriguing, isn't it, that the guidance actually says, which applies to all schools, the governing body must call the, um, the head teacher to account. And, um, yeah. So, yes, I mean, it is confused by the scheme of delegation. Yes, I'm sure. But, um, you know, how that's worked out in that scheme of delegation, nonetheless, the governing body of that school you know, calls the head teacher to account and here you get you know a kind of a critique really of the of the guidance given to school governors it's not very good really in that regard are there any policy makers here i don't know is anyone in the policy world no no 
any other thoughts about about this and how it is? Uh, I'll just chip in a bit on that uh, uh, thing about having the head teacher on the board, and that's oh, yeah. um, I, I find that very strange. Having had experience of charity governance, where yeah. the CEO of the charity was not a governor, not mm. a trustee, mm. um, and I suppose that's more like Matt model now, isn't it? So. Um, I think uh, in the chat, somebody's question yeah. that you just put in a, a note about this. Karen, yes, will that messiness be resolved with the MAT structure? But of course, we're, we're living in this weird hybrid world at the moment where we've got uh, um, some schools in MATs and some not. So, yeah. yes, I, I always find it a very strange thing having the head teacher, and I've always thought that it was mm. part of the board. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think if the it, it for me it creates a disconnect. If uh, a school's head teacher, an academy's head teacher, the person responsible for the day to day operation of that school, right? If their um, their appraisal for or performance management is undertaken by um, the executive principal, okay, because the executive principal um, it kind of hollows out one of the key delegated uh, relationships, in my view, in, you know, in, in that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the school governing body um, uh, delegates the responsibility for running the school to the, to the head teacher. And here we have somebody else outside that structure, um, you know, in the formal appraisal process. Okay, really, and um, you know, certain targets, and um, you know, so it's for me, it's uh, it, it's a confusion, um, <clears throat> but I don't think you can have the proper, um, you know, uh, performance management of the head teacher of the school without having governors of that school um, uh, taking part in that. And I mean, the school where I was a chair of the mat, um, you know, we'd have the uh, members of the governing body and the executive principal taking part in that uh, performance management process. And, um, you know, which was a, a way of getting past that. But, you know, that's because as chair of the MAT, I would always say governing boards, governing boards of each school govern, govern your school. Now, many, many MATs have um, the local, I hate the phrase governing boards, uh, just as advisory bodies, and it's all done, sent all the serious governing work is done by, and the responsibility stuff is done by the MAT board. I think, don't, don't ask me to be a governor of a school where that's the system, because it's just not worth my time. <laughs> so. and, and interestingly, that links with the point you made much earlier about um, uh, institutional legitimacy with mm. the relationship between between the organisation and, and the environment and its environment, mm. and that that's kind of disrupted in these um, yeah. situations, isn't yeah. it? In a mat where the environment is is quite removed from yeah. the, where the legal responsibility, the trust board is. Yeah. Uh, and yes, and we have these these quasi governing boards, which which there's still it's there's a lot of work to do to uh, to make that system. Mm -hmm more understandable and understanding it itself i think yeah well i'm not you know you're, you're absolutely right there rosemary that's a very important point i mean you know trusts well bizarrely range hugely in size and geographical spread as work have done on that in the past um uh what am i going to say it's going out of my head so um uh can uh, the executive board um, of the trust <clears throat> located 80 miles away really know what is happening at a local level in terms of the head teacher's performance and what's happening in a local level in that school? And, uh, you know, that school's role and place and part in the local community. I think you get that from the governing body and the, you know, the parents engaging with that governing body and being members of that governing body. So, you know, I think it it significantly, um, as you said, disrupts the accountability process if you if you're not involved in that. Yeah. 
Zebra Comme Crystal. We also have a, a hand by Abdullah. Abdullah. Sorry, say again. Yeah. Abdullah did put his hand up as well. All right. Yeah, it's just, just uh, I didn't uh, thank you, Chris. It's, okay. Um, uh, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's wonderful that, that, you know, you kind of allowing us to continue to understand governance at various mm -hmm. levels. And what Rosemary was saying and what Chris, what she was saying about mm -hmm. the head teacher being on the board. I'm, in my current research um, and previous work, mm -hmm. there was already voices coming out to say they're not comfortable about um, the head teacher being on the board mm. in some some of the discussions. Mm. So there's already evidence um, in practice to say it shouldn't be happening at least part of the meetings. The head teacher should leave. Mm. Um, and, and therefore, if that's coming through, um, what do we do about from mm. you know um, governance point of view? Um, even uh, even if the head teacher is a member, at least as uh, to allow more, uh, I would say, objective uh, deliberations to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, and and sometimes because of the complexity of the systems we have, mm -hmm. um, we have uh, I don't know the exact thinking behind the head teacher sometimes taking a rather active role in. In managing the, the the governance structure, sometimes mm. Uh, mm. we see that happening, maybe for practical reasons, mm. when it should be done by the mm. governance pro professional, mm. the clerk uh, historically. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, th there are issues about that specific role mm. of the CEO, the head teacher, mm. to be looked into much greater detail. Mm. I, I think, yeah. Mm. What's the question's just been posted? Um, who's just? Um, Karen just posted, posted a question yeah. saying, um, is a Matan institution based on this? Yeah. Or does it replace the school trying to link, um, fr uh, trying to link the frame using this with what mm. I think was your def uh, defining um, mm. of legitimacy? And we also have Andy who wants to contribute. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, a multi-academy trust, uh, you'd expect that to be an institution, wouldn't you? And uh, actually, um, you know, um, uh, that uh, it, it would, um, you could unpack, you, yeah, in fact, it'd be very interesting to hold up the primary task, the um, uh, pillars uh, against an institution, and against a mat, and see what a mat does, see what the mat board does. But if that mat is not legitimate, and if the institutional processes uh, do not secure that legitimacy, well, then it is not legitimate. It's not doing what you would expect a mat to do. Now, I'm talking about here uh, schools, because the guidance on school governing applies to all schools, according to the governance, regardless of uh, the system of governance. But an interesting piece of research to be done to, to use the primary task pillars model and hold that up against a mat and see what a mat actually does and do, you know, what the mats need to do to ensure their legitimacy. Yeah, is that an answer to your question, Karen? Yeah, yeah really useful. And it's, and it's that um, definition of legitimacy, isn't it? Because yeah. framing that and says what whether it is or it isn't yeah um, do you want to go back to that can you go back to that well we're we're, we're we're moving beyond clarification here but that's okay do you want to go back to that very early on the slide that talks about <clears throat> yeah yeah go back go back <clears throat> yeah no no go forward i think <clears throat> notion of legitimacy is that the one uh, no, go, go back, sorry. Yeah, here we are. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, you could, Karen, just say effective um, MAP governance concerned with ensuring the MAP's legitimacy as an organisation. You know, well, what is that? Uh, <clears throat> are they uh, des uh, a desirable, proper, appropriate within some socially constructed system of norms, values, beliefs and definitions? 
Okay, so does a mat do what people expect a mat to do? <clears throat> you know, and you know, it's it is that relationship between a mat and its environment, which is the the crucial issue. Okay, um, well, as ever, clarifications got blurred into ge general discussion, but uh, productively so, I think. So let's just go back to the final set of slides. Okay. Um, so uh, specific prints, uh, yeah, well, let's, let's go. Uh, can we go back a slide, um, Rosanna? Yeah. So what we come up with is um, two main principles and uh, six specific principles. Okay, and they are, we derive those from the argument that's gone on um, previously, okay? And um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, and that's, um, so the first one, ensure what the school does is right in terms of what wider society expects it to do. So that's the main thing, that's the main thing. Okay, and that's what secures its legitimacy. And what, uh, so that's make, you know, is it legitimate? And second main principle, is it doing the right things, institutionalization processes that enable that legitimacy? Okay, so one is about, is it legitimate? Is it do it therefore? And is it doing the things that secure that legitimacy? Okay, so those are the two main principles. Then we got the specific principles and we come up with six, three per slide and up front because it's fundamental and, and because you know the nature of the primary task conditions and this is where you know we would critique and we've sought to extend Dick Scott's work on this is um, <clears throat> to um, uh, oversee the school's work on the institutional primary task whatever you however you describe that um, the governing body have a role, governing board have a role overseeing work on that task. Okay, then we say to doing work on that task needs resources to oversee the resources required and deployed for the school's work on that task. You know, so you've got everything from classrooms, buildings, whatever. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know. Um, and of course teachers and uh, support staff uh, teaching assistants okay and specific principle three right here we go to, to ensure the school conforms to the laws rules and regulations that apply to the institution so here we see the regulatory um, uh, pillar coming in okay that's one of the principles that's what one of the things that uh, that school governors must do that's a principle of effective governance, and we've explained its validity. Okay, right. Next slide, then. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and these are the final three. To ensure the school uh, conforms to the norms. Okay, number four. Um, number five, to ensure the way the school operates in practice on a day-to-day -day basis aligns with what would be expected of a school or an institution by a wider society. Is the way you interpret things, go about things, do things <clears throat> at that kind of daily micro level, does that conform? Is this the kind, are these the kinds of behaviours that you would expect a school to engage in? And then the last one, which we've just spent a bit of time discussing, to oversee the way the head teacher principal fulfils their delegated responsibility for the operation of the school. Okay. All right. I think those are, I think, um, yeah. Okay. So clear on that. And I, in my head, I can see uh, a kind of evidential pathway, an argument uh, that leads to that. Um, yeah. And then, um, okay. Well, where does school improvement plans and strategy um, uh, <clears throat> come in? Uh, well, it's um, to ensure that each of the principles uh, is, is complied with and are complied with, but um, school governing boards will need to evaluate from monetization. So, at the end, that's 
of of bringing in and, and um, uh, into the into, uh, into the print. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, any questions for clarification about that? Or are we we? Yeah, can I ask a question, Chris? Do you mind? Yes. Yeah. The previous slide where you put. Uh, thank you. Um, so school governing board will need to put in place plan improvement. Of course, that would be the head teacher that would do that, wouldn't it? It would. It would. Um, they, they need to be. <clears throat> they need. They need to be brought. That's the best. Um, I think as request to uh, develop plan and to monitor and take that plan. Be right. Slack. Well, it kind of is a school difficulty, and suddenly a role of governing comes for it is us to reduce for is. Yeah. So that's one of the things I find extremely strange in terms of accountability. Things start to be very wrong. So the board comes much more. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm exactly what's the school where that's happened. It's suddenly mm. asked. Right, as I think it's put in place, well, you wouldn't expect it to with approval of the, um, of, of the governor, you know, that's yeah. Um, yeah. To, it's right. It's, but we must be careful though around expect volunteers to do and we skip off because we responsibility to have so that there's just do you know i uh, have always in the past forget where i've done it now but all of you know what doesn't matter actually this is such business you can't away from it or we're own you know actually no voluntary non replacing have a very job to do so it that your I know what you say and that's what might be wrong how would drag a board working very much. Uh, I haven't opened this yet. I wasn't. I was. And that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, the, my point, uh, Chris, was uh, we have seen evidence.